Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Howard Koh. I'm very pleased to welcome you to a new video series entitled What CEOs Say, co-sponsored by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Business School with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our overall goal is to explore how the private sector can leverage its resources to promote health and well-being for society. And in particular, we want to meet business leaders who have committed to promoting a culture that advances health for employees, consumers, communities, and or the environment. We want to hear from these leaders about how they made that commitment, what changes they made, the challenges they faced and how they overcame them, and the lessons learned that they want to share with others. So in that regard, we are very, very pleased to welcome our first guest, Mr. Dan Houston, who is Chair, President, and CEO, our Principal Financial Group. And this business, which is located in Iowa but has worldwide reach, employs over 15,000 people in 19 countries, reaches some 22 million mm -hmm. clients, is that right? Uh, and has, as a fall of 2018, over $600 billion in assets under management. Now, of great interest to uh, this audience and for people watching online is that Principal Financial Group has earned a host of awards over the years. And let me just tell you about some of them. Being recognized as among the best places to work, being the best or among the best employers in America for women, executive women, and working mothers, being among America's best employers for new graduates and for diversity, being among America's most just companies and among the world's most ethical companies. You've even uh, received recognition for being one of the most military-friendly employers. And these recognitions come from groups as diverse as Forbes, the National Association for Female Executives, Working Mother Magazine, Ethisphere, Just Capital, GI Jobs Magazine, and many, many others. So, Mr. Housen, welcome to Harvard, and welcome to Boston. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, this is a health audience, so let's just start with some basics. Tell us what a uh, financial services company does, and tell us what you do day-to-day -day as CEO, president, and chair. Yeah, boy, the second question could get me in trouble, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're here to serve the needs of all, um, all workers, all individuals, to help them reach financial success. And frankly, financial success is really hard and difficult to reach if you don't have a physical health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to work very hard in order to strike the appropriate balance through education, through advice, through guidance, to help people understand that the more healthy lifestyle they live today, mm -hmm. the more they focus on their financial well-being, the higher probability they'll enjoy a higher quality uh, life later in life. So that's in large part what we do. As you mentioned, uh, we manage well in excess of $600 billion in 90 different countries around the world, big operations in both Latin America, Asia, and the United States. And those 22 million customers uh, are really as diverse as you might expect, not only geographically, but they're diverse in terms of their ages and their wealth and their income. And what I would tell you, from the lowest wage earner to the very highest wage earner, that is effectively the cohort, that's the group of individuals that we serve worldwide. So it's interesting to he hear about your clientele because some people would assume that a financial services company is simply serving the well-off. So tell us more about how you're serving people of all income backgrounds and, and more. So if I could, I'd give you a sort of a typical uh, client. If I were just to take a average client of the principal financial group, if they're a retirement plan customer or 401k plan customer in your nomenclature on the university campus, it would be 403Bs. They would have 125 employees. They would generally have a very broad cross-section of industries, all the way from janitorial services to investment banking. They, in large part, don't have a personal advisor at all. Maybe the top 10% out of that 125 might, so 10 to 12 people might have an advisor. Those other 100 employees oftentimes are looking to us for guidance, advice, and education. We do that at the work site. We do that in person at small meetings at the work site. We do it in one-on-one -on -one meetings at the work site. And some of it's done telephonically through our call centers. I, I take the, and I view it as an honor, 
I do go down to our call center and I'll take a headphone jack and, and go into the console because I want to hear firsthand what people are up against. And I have yet to ever do that on a random basis and had a phone call that was, was taking place on anybody that was making more than about $50,000 a year. So it gives you the sense of the sort of uh, employee who's calling in. What are their questions? Oftentimes the questions, am I saving enough? Am I putting it in a diverse enough portfolio? This is sort of my language. They may not use that exact nomenclature. They're going through a divorce. Someone's lost a job. Should I take a loan? Should I not take a loan? Should it be a hardship withdrawal? Those are all the questions that the average American worker needs answers to, yeah, everyone, and we provide those answers. Everyone can relate to those questions. They really can, yeah. 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 So tell us more about how you have advanced a culture that helps the health of employees, consumers, the community, and or the environment. Well, Dr. Coe, one of the things that uh, there's an enormous burden on a CEO, we're a 140-year-old company. <laughs> and as 140 years, I'm the only the 15th person that's held this particular job as the CEO. Mm -hmm. And our commitment to middle America, our commitment to middle income wage earners didn't start with me. It's been part of our ethos for the last 140 years. And so what typically uh, is going to take place as we sort of prioritize our resources is to make sure that we are serving everyone equally. That's a, that is, as you might expect, a, a big priority. But it's in all facets of what we do because we need to make sure that we have a, a good health and wealth uh, balance for our employees. We have it for our customers, and we try to make sure that we strike the right sort of balance for our investors as well. So tell us more about how you came upon this philosophy, how, how you embraced it. It sounds like it's part of your history, the it, history, history of the company, right? So if you went back, uh, you know, and in, a in, in number of books have been written about the company in this regard, and I'll give you just maybe a couple of, of points of, of interest. And this is one I found fascinating because we just remodeled a building that was built, started in 1938 and finished in 1940. And one of the funny stories that came out of it, because the superintendent, today we'd call that a vice president, but that was a construction superintendent at the time, they were building the building and they had made their decision on that we were going to use clean uh, fuel to fire the building, and it was going to be oil. The alternative to that was coal. But there were two things we were doing with this building. We were putting in larger windows, and the windows would be uh, allowed to be open uh, for fresh air. It was going to be the first building west of the Mississippi that had air conditioning. And it would be the first building of commercial size that would burn fuel oil. Well, Iowa at the time, if you go back into the 1930s, was a net exporter of coal. And so it was the coal miners that were picketing across our front door we have pictures of the coal miners picketing because we had the audacity to burn oil and fast forward 75 years and as we modernize the building as you might expect there were major changes made LED lighting there were steps that were taken we recycled 95 percent of the materials that came out of the building every carpet square every ceiling tile every piece of copper every metal and so the company has a long-standing history the tie, if you will, back to the sensitivity around building materials, we have a commercial real estate portfolio greater than $26 billion. A large portion of that is green uh, building. And we found out a long time ago, well in excess of a decade ago, that we could build a green building, better environmentally for, for individuals, whether it was all the, the uh, toxins that can exist in carpets and ceiling tiles, LED lighting, moving the air through the building more quickly, et cetera. Maybe it adds 10% to the cost of the building. Their recoup on that is measured in months and, and not decades for certain. So that sort of gives you uh, a mindset that we've used uh, not only in, in our business, but then the value that that creates for our customers through enhanced returns and better returns ultimately for shareholders. That's a fascinating example because it's, on one hand, an environmental example, um, but it's also an example that 
impacts customer, uh, customers, as you said, but also employees, right? Very much. Uh, do you want to say, how, how do the employees react to uh, that sort of investment? I, I know this. I've been with the company now for uh, over 35 years. I don't think anybody was as concerned 35 years ago. Let me restate that. Mm -hmm. No one mm -hmm. was concerned no. about that 35 years ago. Today, if you look at the statistics, among millennials, it's about 75%. Non-millennials, all, it's about 66%. Care about the company culture, mm -hmm. care about your environmental positions, care about your carbon footprint, mm -hmm. care about what you're doing back to your respective communities. I was reading an article coming out this morning that my father had sent to me, and it was about uh, women in the workforce, mm -hmm. in boards of directors. He was talking about women in middle management but it was also talking about the importance that millennials are pay placing on ESG related issues, mm -hmm. environmental, social, governance related issues. Now what I thought most interesting about that is, my father's 85 years old. Mm -hmm. And the handwritten note that he put on there, Dan, Dan, I, I, I was so proud to see this article. It, it's in large part what you guys already do, keep up mm -hmm. the good work. Mm -hmm. 85 year olds usually don't want to send their sons, you know, that sort of, but that was, <laughs> he even connected all of those dots uh -huh. that that was important if yeah. you're going to be a successful yeah. business and he gets uh -huh. that. Yeah, so there's a theme we're hearing more about that this is of concern for all of us in the present, but for future generations and with millennials leading the way, it's going to be even more important, you feel. A third of our workers are millennials. and. If there's any one thing I, I have been overly impressed with in regards to the millennials, other than the high degree of sensitivity around ESG-related issues, how many baby boomers in the room, <laughs> right? How many raised a millennial? Guess what? <laughs> They're better savers than us. <laughs> they are. They mm -hmm. save more than the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And that's really refreshing, and they're doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Their footprint is just flat out smaller in, ter you know, in terms of housing, in terms of many aspects of their life, they put a higher degree of weighting on social issues, they put a higher degree of weighting mm -hmm. on environmental issues. Mm -hmm. uh, when they look to go to work for an employer, there is a bit of an underwriting, and if you think about unemployment in this country, three and a half, four percent, maybe a little bit less of that, uh, less than that. If all of a sudden you're competing, and you're there on wage, and you're there on opportunity, and you're there in terms of the right industry, and you start looking at what are the differences, I think it's going to get down to issues like this. Interesting. So someone with your philosophy has got to adopt a long-term view, but you, you have a lot of short-term pressures to earn profits and um, uh, keep all your uh, shareholders and stockholders happy. So how, how do you balance all that in your daily work? So it, it starts with uh, setting the expectation with investors in the very beginning. And we have always uh, tried to strike the appropriate balance between great, giving great value to the customer, mm -hmm. giving a employee the right sort of uh, set of benefits, whether it's time off to volunteer, it's a, it's a competitive wage, it's, a, it's, a, it's an environment that is an inviting, that has, uh, if you saw our facilities, you'd be, I'm certain, quite impressed with the, the nature in which we've, we've reorganized our work to create more collaboration and create more of a sense of community. But ultimately, if you've uh, informed your investors on what we think our returns are going to be mm -hmm. and what our financial performance is going to look like, frankly, it takes a lot of the pressure off because we're already on the record with what it is we're trying to mm -hmm. accomplish. There are other firms that might be in our industry that might have some of those metrics that might be more appealing to some investors. Uh, but that's, those are the choices, those are the trade-offs right. we make every single day. Right. Okay, this, this is fascinating. So, you put it all together, do you think this gives you a competitive advantage as a business compared to others? And do people see it or, or not? Well, you made me blush when you made the introduction of the company mm -hmm. uh, because that track record of recognition from companies like Fortune and Forbes and Ethisphere, mm -hmm. um, we're proud to have earned those and we also know that they could be taken away like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires us to constantly nurture it to ensure that a lot of the groundwork that was laid, the old proverb, uh, Chinese proverb, when you drink from the well, remember the men and women who, who dug the well mm -hmm. right here on this campus, a lot of the practices and a lot of the cultures that you have here, what makes Harvard, Harvard, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. is because the forefathers had done a good job getting yeah. you to this point. Yeah. I have that same pressure. Mm -hmm. My management team has that same pressure. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to strike that right balance. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, the company f has forever, back in 1938, again, that superintendent had written the message to the board of directors, it would be appropriate to have a gymnasium so employees would have the opportunity to have physical fitness throughout the day. Wow. There could be intramural sports. I mean, it, it's just when you read it, you just think, wow, that's how they spoke back then. Mm -hmm. But even our leaders at the time knew that physically fit employees running more oxygen through the brain, having more sort of physical activity, creating more energy, sense of creativity, they even knew that then. Volunteerism has been part of our culture forever. Uh, we host a seniors golf event, the Champions Principal Charity Classic Champions event. Last year, we raised $3.6 million just for children's charities, just in Des Moines, Iowa, Central Iowa, to try to make a difference among those five children's charities, giving back to the community, fitness and well-being, all of those things that go into the value proposition mm -hmm. of working for the working for the principal. Yeah, it's very striking how <coughs> these themes run through the history of your company forever. So, yeah. yeah. So it's so it's very personal for you, but it's part of the culture of your company. It's and like. the sustainability of that. Mm -hmm. And so again, where we started this was the third-party validation. Right. You know, at any given time, I, you know, I, I worry it as culture advances that you tear away at the very fabric. And at some point you find, you know what, you've, you've ripped it now. It's no longer mm -hmm. something you can put back together. So when we look for acquisitions, we underwrite in three areas. We underwrite for strategic fit, we underwrite for strategic, financial, and cultural. Mm -hmm. And most people want to always jump on the bandwagon of, bandwagon of saying, well, you pay too much or you pay too little. Never heard that one before. <laughs> but my view is this. You can get the price wrong. You might get the strategy you know, slightly wrong. Maybe it, maybe it was just slightly turned off 90 degrees. But if you get that cultural piece wrong, it's game over. Mm -hmm. you, you can't make those up in time. Financial, you'll get their strategy. You'll kind of get the, you know, the boat turned right in the right direction. But culture matters. And we've made 14 acquisitions since the Great Recession. And that's not insignificant, and there's a very stringent sort of onboarding. But the due diligence process, where most companies, I think, are to some degree interrogating the acquired company for everything about their company, I would say that probably 15 to 20 percent of the sales process is my having a conversation with you to right. tell you this is what we look like. This yeah. is our culture. It's our DNA. It's our ethos. Mm -hmm. It's how we think. It's how we make decisions. It's collaborative, it's global, uh, and if, if that doesn't work for you, not going to be a good fit. Yeah. So trying to join uh, what we're trying to do here, uh, the worlds of the private sector and public health is, right. is not easy. In fact, no one's quite tried to do this before. Right. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of skeptics out there saying, oh, the business CEOs aren't really bought into all this. So that sort of public perception on, is one example of a lot of the challenges out there. Can you just tell us about some of the challenges you've faced in, in trying to adopt this philosophy and what's helped you address them and even overcome them? You can just start with the magnitude of, of healthcare. In this country, it's about 20% of GDP. Mm -hmm. You could end this conversation right there and say if $1 out of every five is around healthcare, mm -hmm. then it, it matters to all of us. For every dollar you spend in retirement that goes to healthcare, is a dollar that doesn't go to other retirement related activities. Think about that. That's a really, really big number. So if my job is to make sure that Americans and people in Latin America and people in Asia, they get to decide to retire when they choose, 62, 63, 65, 67. And the way that I help them, the way principal helps them, is to put them in a position of having optionality or choices. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you, not only will healthcare have been a big part of their accumulation phase, it will be equally and more important as they draw down on their nest egg to offset their living expenses. And healthcare is going to be single, for everyone in this room, mm -hmm. single largest expenditure going into retirement. Mm -hmm. In our business of financial services, we have no choice but to respect and help educate and inform 
on matters related to health insurance, right. health-related expenditures. Right. So that's why it's so close to uh, close to us, and and it has been. It's been part of the company for a very very long time. And you have this fascinating approach where you're based in the U.S., but you have this global reach and. I know you travel a lot as, as right. CEO. As you, as you do this work around the around the world, what, what are some of the challenges you face in, in various countries or various parts of the world? It's replicated over and over and over and over. Just to put it in perspective, though, uh, because oftentimes we can look at our sort of long-term retirement financial affairs in this country on money set aside for retirement. This country, through the last 50-plus years, has amassed roughly $22 trillion dollars not an insignificant amount of money. Of that $22 trillion, about $15 trillion is IRAs, rollover IRAs, 401k, 457, 403, 403b. Okay? Voluntary contributions in this country, $15 trillion. That other, set of, that other $7 trillion is really defined benefit. It's what the employer had accumulated. Take the defined benefit plan, set it aside, because most people in this room may not have one or listening. The remaining $15 trillion is a bigger pile of money than the next 19 developed countries combined. So we haven't done it perfect, but we've done it pretty well. Our job is to make sure that around the world we take our technology, our digital assets, our asset management capabilities, our, our knowledge, and export that to China, to India, to Malaysia, to Thailand, to Chile, to Mexico, et cetera. And we've done that with a fair amount of success. But the issues around healthcare expenditures are real. Yeah. The generation of, of students going through Harvard today with their DNA and their, their lifestyles today, they will end up living more years in retirement than the actual number of years that they work. They'll have more breaks of service, all of those averages. They'll live more years in retirement than they will actually work. And if you went back to FDR and the, you know, the onset of Social Security, what was the probability you would, you would cash a Social Security check at age 65? Real low, less than 10%. Today, Pretty high probability right. you're going to yeah. get there. So, so the economics are off. And so if the private sector right. doesn't do it, it's a problem. Right. Governments aren't in a position to do it. Right. Employers really aren't in a position to do it. This is really a burden that falls on our, on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. So this health care, we, we want good health and fitness. It's why we, have, you know, we reimburse for, you know, whether it's smoking cessation, we reimburse for weight loss, we reimburse for gym memberships, we have gym facilities in all of our operations, we promote taking time off during the day to, to get physical fitness and all those different things. Because as a company, we spend about $160 million a year on health-related expenditures. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of coin. Yeah. Yeah. And so to the degree we can have a healthier population of workers, that puts us in a more favorable position to create more value for our employees in other ways. Okay, fascinating comments and discussions about what is health in this day and age have now expanded to really involve um, mental health and emotional well-being mm -hmm. and stress at the workplace. Actually, our Professor Blendon, who runs the studio, has done some polling work showing that those are critical issues for employees around the country and around the world. Do you want to just talk about stress at the workplace and, and well-being, emotional well-being at the workplace and how that relates to, to your work? It's real. It's out there. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a few issues out there that uh, come to mind, and the first one of which is the over-reliance on opiates and the impact that's having. It, it is real. If you haven't read the, the book uh, um, Dope Sick, read it. It gives you some really sort of inside perspectives on the over-prescribing of, of, of drugs and what that, uh, what that means. Mm -hmm. I think there's also an element around mental and nervous, and I think all of us have known people who are directly impacted by this. Someone's going to have back surgery, breaks a leg, breaks an arm, we put our arms around them, how can we help you out, can we bring some food over, take all the time you need, all those issues. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mental and nervous issues are not resolved as issue, um, mental health 
is increasingly a challenge uh, on a lot of different levels. It is one of those industries that continues to grow and I think it continues to evolve and I think you know we're sort of at the beginning stages of that. But all of those issues are things that we have to be conscious about mm -hmm. as an employer. So again, how do you create a work environment that doesn't contribute to stress? Giving people uh, flexible time off. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not keeping track of your hours. I'm really interested in one thing, the output. Mm -hmm. What's your contribution? What did you do to advance the company's mission? You had a certain set of tasks to accomplish. Did you do that? How do we create an environment which doesn't create stress? That comes into hiring and firing. Make sure that we have a diverse group of senior leaders. Make sure that they're inclusive. Making sure that people don't come to work with, a, with anxiety about just the people they're working with, let alone the work that they're doing. Um, how do you create an environment where, at the end of the day, we're doing a social good? We're in the insurance business, the disability insurance, the retirement business, mm -hmm. the asset management business. I'd be hard-pressed to say that we have any product that doesn't really do an enormous job of providing great social good around financial well-being. And if you have good financial well-being, many times you'll, that leads to strong physical mm -hmm. and health well-being. So that's, that's sort of easy for me to get my head around and, and around. Matter of fact, I'll I tell you a quick story, uh, Dr. Coe, that I was reflecting on this only because it was the one-year anniversary of the gentleman who had hired me. His name was Chad Sims in Dallas, Texas. And I had two other job offers. And you should know that the principal financial group before 1985, its name was the Banker's Life Insurance Company. So I was interviewing for the job, and he had asked me about these other employers. And I'll, I'll go ahead and use those names. It's, it's been over 35 years. <laughs> and I said, uh, matter of fact, I remember Kathy Johnson was the recruiter from <laughs> Georgia Pacific. And uh, Chad always had a way of sort of getting what he wanted to get done. And he said, so, Dan, i got to ask you a question. Georgia Pacific, do you, do you want to be in the plywood business the rest of your life? Uh, Mr. Sims, I, you know, I don't know if that's such a great idea, you know. And, he said, this other company, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber, he says, you really want to be in the tire business the rest of your life? And I thought, gee, Mr. Sims, I, you know, I don't know if that's the best answer. He says, come to the Banker's Life Company, and you'll change lives the rest of your life. And he was right. It's, it's, been, it's been incredibly rewarding to be in an industry where we do a lot of good. We can always improve. But for the most part, we get a lot of things right. Okay. Tell, tell us more about... Um how you measure success? What what is success? How do you measure it? What, what are there metrics you're tracking in, in this part of the work that you're doing for the CEO? Well, it's not height and weight because I <laughs> fail on both of those. <laughs> and the right weight, I'm just four inches too short. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know the, the metrics for us aren't the ones you might immediately jump to. So, for example, one way you could measure a financial company is the assets under management. You could measure, for example, the operating earnings, your return on invested capital, your internal rate of return. I'm not going to suggest that those aren't all important. But when we really dissect it and say, what's going to make us successful long term? The sheer number of clients that we have of all kinds. Mm -hmm. How diverse is our workforce? Mm -hmm. How inclusive is our workforce? Another big one is, how close are you to being on track to replacing 85% of your income at retirement. And we measure that. So what percent of all of our customers are on track mm -hmm. to reach an 85% income replacement ratio at age 65? Mm -hmm. To do that math real easily, if you're making $100,000 a year today and you were gonna retire, have we helped you save enough money mm -hmm. that would generate $85,000 a year in income? Mm -hmm. That means we were successful. And for any of those that kind of want to skip the book and kind of get right to the punchline, if over the course of a 35-year working career, you saved 15% of your income mm -hmm. and set it aside in a diversified portfolio, didn't take hardship withdrawals, didn't take a loan, you'll replace 85% of your income. Mm -hmm. So through employer matching contributions, mm -hmm. through salary deferrals, whatever it takes to get there, that's mm -hmm. the math. And that financial That's your robo-advisor lesson for the day. <laughs> <laughs> and that financial security is part of well-being. How could it not be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk to people about stress in their lives. Mm -hmm. We already, stress in lives and stress in marriages. What's number one? Mm -hmm. It's money. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's around income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And for the most part, one thing that we do need to sort of get in check, it's the spending. We, we, we buy a lot of convenience and more discipline should be applied. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, I mentioned my father earlier, but you know, one of the big lessons he always gave me was pay yourself first. You know, set the money aside first, pay yourself first, get your savings in order first, then apply it to the other, the other areas. Um, I, I feel compelled to, to share this, uh, Dr. Coe, because again, we, we put a lot of energy into all customers and all employees everywhere we do business. Mm -hmm. We have a program in India, Pune, India to be specific, where, where we have roughly 1,500 employees on our way to 2,000. It's an amazing group of professionals. We have uh, MDs, uh, some of them would have come right from Harvard. Mm -hmm. We have data scientists, we have actuaries. We have a really professional group of, of employees that uh, work and live in Pune. Our give back to that community was to work with an NGO in uh, establishing something called the Lighthouse. The Lighthouse is located right on the fringes of the slums. But the idea was to work with the, the elders within those slums and to identify at-risk teenagers, those people who have dropped out of formal education, but they are kind of coming in on that adulthood age. We put together a program that if you looked at the one-year success rate, for every 100 individuals that we're able to work with out of that area, and the, and the program is roughly 12 weeks of working with those individuals, 85% of them, after one year, are in a middle income job. Middle income is defined in Pune, India, much different than it is defined here. But the, but the real point is some of those people end up working for principal, but one person at a time. You know, could we influence 85 and 200 and 400 and 600? You do what you can, but that's, that's what we see as our obligation for those people who aren't direct customers. Our ability to give back to the community has everything to do with helping people get on track to be a middle income uh, wage earner. So in the last few minutes of this interview, tell, tell us uh, more about your personal and professional leadership philosophy. We, we talk a lot about leadership uh, through the series. We're in a leadership studio. We try to teach this to our students. So just reflect on some of your learnings about leadership personally, professionally, and um, what you would want others to know. This is probably the at-risk part of the program mm -hmm. for all my direct reports who would say, <laughs> that's a different Dan, but I'll see if I can get this as, as close as I can. I, I've always subscribed to the notion of servant leadership, and if I could just sort of dissect that for just a minute. I know that there are some leaders that would say it's kind of my way of the highway. You know, you kind of get on board with my thinking, my way of doing things, do that successfully, and you just made the team. I discriminate against every single, single one of my direct reports every single day, but everyone gets treated fairly. And I view it as my job to adapt my, my style to their style. I have 11 direct reports. And I want to make sure that they, to some degree, take on the same sort of notion that we only need one Dan, we only need one Nora, one Luis, <coughs> one Tim, you know, one Amy. And if they take the approach of being a servant leadership, i.e., they're the ones adapting and adjusting their approach to maximize the value creation from each one of their direct reports, I think you just get a better result. Mm -hmm. We already know that diverse teams get better answers. Mm -hmm. We also know inclusive teams get better answers. We all know that listening versus talking it all generally gets you a better outcome. But communications, honesty, integrity, uh, trustworthiness, all of those things sort of well uh, melded into a servant approach to leadership is, from my perspective, mm -hmm. one of the most, at least uh, what appears to be, effective ways of maximizing the resources of a, of a company. So do you think these themes can apply to companies that are a lot smaller than yours that don't have the resources that you have? Uh, are these universal principles or do they have to be tailored somehow? Absolutely, and, and it's funny because I think of ourselves as being a medium-sized company. Mm. You look at the global playing field that we're up against and we have competitors with a quarter of the main employees. Uh, our new head of uh, HR uh, that we recruited from a retirement uh, he worked for a company with 280,000 associates. He had 60,000 in his division. He's mm -hmm. got 15,000 with the principal. So, mm -hmm. 
again, I heard him sort of talk about small companies. So uh, it's all relative. Uh, so our our largest customer base is small to medium sized businesses. As I said earlier, our average size pension client is 125. Our average size life and disability customer is 44. Oftentimes, we know one thing's for sure. The owner or sole proprietor or the partners, they're the chief risk officer, they're the chief financial officer, they're the chief human resources officer. So we need to make sure that we really have the mindset of understanding what small employers mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. by definition. And when we have programs to support them, we go into it from a position of strength because we have roughly 140,000 small to medium sized customers that we interact with every day. And the person we're interacting with isn't a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It's not the chief uh, human resources officer of a Fortune 250. It is someone with very, very different skill sets. And so for that reason, I think much of our leadership that we have and that we, our orientation is around small to medium sized employers is very transferable to a sole proprietor or, or very small business. So in the final couple minutes here, just share with us any, <coughs> any thoughts you have for uh, people who emulate you or for people who want to work at this intersection between private business and public health. And again, there are a lot of folks out there who say these two worlds just can't talk to each other and we're trying to do this and having you has been so enlightening. But how would you advise both worlds uh, to work better together as we move forward? Well, I would tell you, I like the crossroads of my life of being in, 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 the, in the crosshairs of, of, of these two issues because I think they're both incredibly important. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I would say. Um, one, of the, one of the luxuries you have in working for a company that supports involvement and outside activities is to be in bar involved with the Partnership for Healthy America. Mm -hmm and some of the brightest minds I can think about and what we're trying to deal with the issue of childhood obesity. And it's a lot of very serious work. Michelle Obama's been heavily involved. Dr. Uh, Gavin's been heavily involved. But it's a group of professionals. It's a, it's a not-for-profit organization mm -hmm. that recognizes these food deserts that occur in a lot of these major cities. What can we do around making fruits and vegetables more accessible right. to individuals? And you might ask, Dan, why would you be involved with an organization that's concerned about childhood obesity? Because they're all my customers. Sooner or later, that is a group of people themselves, their parents, their grandparents, their kids, who become dependent on much of the product and services that we provide. To the degree that I better understand what those food deserts constitute, how we could eradicate it, how we could do a better job communicating and, and solving some of those social issues, the better off we're gonna be as a company. Mm -hmm. But I can assure you this, I'm a better person for having been involved in, in that organization. And, and I can say that about most all organizations I've ever been, been part of because this has become such a, such a large issue. Mm -hmm. Public policy doesn't have the luxury of putting things in, in silos because it cuts across all uh, demographics, it cuts, cuts across all lifestyles, and business is going to have to have to be there. And there's a there's a quid pro quo, either pay it today in some mm -hmm. sort of social tax or or pay it off in the future. Mm -hmm. The last comment I would say in terms of just characteristics, one of the things I value in leaders and uh, all workers is intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how things that happen in biology or things that happen in chemistry and science think about them for a little bit and you can see how they might impact your business. Mm -hmm. um, and as we have this digital transformation, I, I really do believe, you know, we all read about the Industrial Revolution and, and how Ford went about solving those problems. We are right in the crosshairs mm -hmm. of the digital revolution and it's going to change every single business. And if you don't have intellectual curiosity, if you don't understand the impact Look at just the announcements this morning between Microsoft and Walgreens. Look at the previously announced uh, uh, discussions between Amazon and, and Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. Health, health care, health expenditures is a big part of all of our lives. And if you don't get your arms around <laughs> it, it'll consume us. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating interview, and Mr. Houston, we're very, very honored to have you here, and thank you so much for being the first to kick off this series. It's been a privilege okay. and an honor. Thank you so thank much. You. All the best.